everybody, and welcome back to the Chiluminati Podcast, episode 184. As always, I am one of your hosts, Mike Martin, joined by the Rick Mile and Adrian Edmondson of LA. No, nope, this, this I don't know this one. I don't know who these people are. Yeah, baby. I didn't think so. It's another it's another English like com- like comedy duo. Uh, they you were a you, double you, act. You thought you were gonna find another crankies? I'm ho- maybe I will. I don't know. I didn't look into this one, just like I didn't look into the crankies last time. Uh, They were in a cult classic BBC series called The Young Ones, um, mainly because there were other actors sharing the screen with them and they were in Bottom. I don't know what that is. In Bottom? uh, And they they were in Guest House Paradiso, which is so apparently offensively stupid and tedious that even the actors start to look bored and fairly embarrassed by the end of it. Cool. So who the fuck am I? I don't know. You want to be Rick Mile or Adrian Edmondson? Based off name alone. Which one didn't drink themselves into poverty? Uh, well, uh, hmm. I mean, based that's off good... name alone, you have to be Adrian because you seem more like an Adrian. Adrian. Yeah, you seem like an Adrian. Adrian. I'm the other guy because he seems kind of boring. Did you guys see a picture of them? Oh, Rick Mile is dead. Well, yeah, that sounds like me. Mm-hmm. I feel that way mm-hmm. sometimes. Yeah, they're uh, he's dead. The other one is Rick not. Mile, like one. Here, I'm going to link you boys right now. Uh, everybody's favorite news website, The Mirror. All right, yeah. All right. Calls his long-term friend a selfish bastard for dying without him. Well, I mean, I guess that's, that's, that's kind of sweet. Yeah, that's kind of nice, I guess. That feels like the, the height of British comedy, to be honest. <laughs> he didn't drink himself to death. He just died from a heart attack. Well, there you go. Oh, don't well, put which, that on I don't me. know. And seeing, just going off this photo, which one are you? Uh, probably the goofy one with glasses, to be honest. All right. I'll, so, take, I'll take it. Yeah. All right. And Alex is the goofy one with long hair. Honestly, <laughs> yeah. it fits. Yeah, it works. Yeah, it, fits. it works. It's well. all right. Similar to now. Yeah. You know, exactly. It's the best. I thought I had long hair uh, for a long time until I met Mathis. Yeah. Yeah. It's been long, man. I have a long hair. What kind I of feel say? like a military guy instead. Like a military to... man. <laughs> anyway, Alex, you, uh, you know, you're supposed to take this off my hands at this point. Take what off your hands? Money? Like right into the pockets of Patreon.com slash Illuminati Paul. Because that's exactly what I'm about to do. Wait, 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 wait. Wrong show, sir. What? Wrong show. Uh, 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 Excuse me. uh, uh, Excuse me. Dean, can we note? Guys, go there. You get the idea. This is a free show. It's a free show that you don't have to listen to. You don't have to pay anything. There's no, there's no, it's just a wonderful agreement between us and you who likes what we do, that you give us a little bit of money, you get stuff in return also, and we keep making a show at a bar that you guys are happy with and at a pace that you guys are happy with. You know, you didn't say the the bar was high. You just said the bar that you're happy with, which is That's a promise kept right there. The more we're funded, the higher the bar goes because then the team grows, you know what I mean? If you're there, you care, right? You know what I'm saying? One day we will have a studio where we can record in person together. That would it's require that you have to move to a place where I agree. And you think it's a bi- well, do you think I want to be in Texas for the rest well, of we'll my goddamn first life? First, we'll buy Mathis a small airplane. We'll buy him a small airplane. Maybe you, you can do. I don't know. Place. Maybe that's what the Iron Man guy is all about. Maybe eventually you'll be that guy and you can fly here from Texas anytime you want to do Maybe a show. We'll Maybe a that's the long and you I like. Mean, I mean, that would be phenomenal if we, yeah. you know, if any one of those quote unquote genius billionaires could create that kind of technology, but Elon can barely handle Twitter before quitting. So I'm not too hopeful that that kind of technology is going to come anytime soon. Does anybody call them the CEO of Quitter yet? <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, but I'm um, um, probably going to delete my Quitter for that. <laughs> oh, shit. He just can't stop. <laughs> can't quit. Oh, yes, you can. <laughs> can't quit. Yes, you can. The best part quit. is he's doing this with a complete straight face. Yeah. Looking down at his microphone, not even acknowledging. Like, the, like the most shameful stand up he's ever done. You can't it look really at the is. audience. It really is. I, I don't care for Elon Musk. <laughs> Neither do I. <laughs> if that isn't obvious at, the, at 184 episodes where our particular opinions lie, uh, you haven't been listening. What are we doing here? What's going on? Please, I don't know, man. Please support us on Patreon.com slash Illuminati This is a Jesse episode, dude. Everybody's oh, going to be happy. This is episode? one of the, the... This is a Jesse episode, oh. and all Jesse has told us in text is that our minds are going to be blown. He then proceeded earlier today to tease me further by then saying, I won't even know what it is for a while, and then when it happens, I'm going to be like, what? And you yes. know, like that's, this is a not a this is not your normal Jesse episode. This is, a, is not. 
This is going to take us to a crazy territory. Oh, now, it is I- historical. It is. It does involve facts. Some might say figures. But I'm going to take you on an adventure. Please, in advance, forgive me, audience, and the two of you. Oh. Uh, apparently, my bedroom was, like, very dry last night. Woke up today with, like, you know, like a scratchy oh, throat. Oh, yeah, that sucks. So I am... Doing everything in my power to drink water and tea yeah, please. and be good for this. Well, so go, take, take a sip of water because I want to thank somebody real quick. I want to thank okay. Gang of Breath for the dope ass art. I just wanted to shout that out. It's a, I made it my phone. I loved it so oh, much. Yeah. The phone Dude, background, the like it's green so good. Chiluminati. Okay, thank you, phone. It's like the green big eyed Chiluminati I sent you boys via text. Yeah. It's freaking sick. I goddamn love it. It's very it's sick. It's very cool. It reminds me of uh, the box art for The Dig, if you ever played The I've Dig. I've played The Dig. What is The Dig? It's like old school, like back yeah. last time I had a PC was like in the 90s, early 90s. So <laughs> also, I have one last question, unless you already saw my Twitter. It's a fun game. I'm going to show you a photo. How old do you think I am in this photo? And that photo where you look like yourself, but just a small child, 11 <laughs> years old. Mathis is 14. You, in that de- photo. Alex is, is correct. <laughs> that's a 14. No, that's no 14 year old. Oh, that's me in high school. That's me in my, oh my high school. That's me well, in high school. Well, it's all starting to come together now, <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, you started, everything's starting to make sense, isn't it? <laughs> he was just sitting there, just like, I hope Everything that the is... devil gets me ad- abducted by aliens. Dude, I was. I... <laughs> <laughs> now that I see the 14 year old you. Everything that you say clicks, like it all clicks. <laughs> Does it? Does it all make it sense is. finally? Oh yeah, it's all making that sense for me like now. Once, in a couple years, I'm going to be arrested in a graveyard for having Dungeons and Dragons books in my car. <laughs> God, that was a horrible night. <laughs> oh man, yeah. All right, cool. That's my game. All right, I'm done now. <laughs> Did I'm win? done saying, "Look I at me, look at me." Uh, Jesse, I'm handing you control. Here's the microphone. Gentle. Go for it. Listeners at home. Today's episode features uh, text from the Smithsonian, um, various historical websites, esoteric, uh, several books that were written during the time period and also much later, and a newspaper from London at the time. Um, because today I'm going to take you on a ride. It's going to be a wild one through history that you are definitely not ready for, but I promise. When we get where this is going, you'll be like, what? Wait, what? Because we are headed back to the island of Corsica in 1769. At the time, despite it being very close to Italy, the island was controlled by France. And there, on the 15th of August, a boy was born that would change the face of Europe forever. Any clue on who this boy might be? God. Not Kal-El. 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 Yeah, Kal-El. No. Napoleon. Napoleon Bonaparte, yes. There you go. Absolutely. Right, Born into a minor house of, uh, you know, not too much status. He was only really, like, his family was only really, like, local power players on the island. It seemed like Napoleon's life would be one of comfort, but obscurity. However, the French, in an effort to integrate the island like they did with all of their territories that they claimed... They would integrate them into society, and by doing so, push the sons of nobles and aristocracy into civil service of the military. So Napoleon, at a young age, enters the army as an artillery officer. And honestly, it's not the best place to be, because like the artillery officer was kind of like the redheaded stepchild of the officer corps at the time, because France in the 1780s, it's all about aristocracy and pompous displays of wealth and being big shots and flaunting your big fancy feathers and your like your buckles and stuff. So he's Bobby Boucher. <laughs> he really is water boring this entire <laughs> thing. Yes. I have not seen water boy. Don't worry. Adam I mean, Sandler, though. I know that. We'll, we'll, we'll get to it eventually. Yeah, you we'll think so? You think we'll get to uh, By Waterboy? By 2050, you will have seen water boy. <laughs> All right. That's a promise. Yeah. That's a promise. And like I was saying, it's a society where. The wealthy run and control everything and refuse to let anyone they see as lower into the club. And while Napoleon isn't poor, he's not rich enough. And so this didn't sit too well with him. He hated being there. And so he left the army to return to Corsica and there he would have stayed. But then, as if right on schedule, the world changed. Turns out uh, the rich out-of-touch members of society flaunting their wealth no. isn't something people enjoy. 
What? And no. the French. I, I, Crazy. I'm convinced that we worship those with money here in America. And they've been uh, trying real hard to get us to do it. But, you know, yeah. I think we're about to get to a tipping point soon. You know, when we get our first trillionaire, we'll see how everything goes. Well, the French decided <laughs> their decision was to rise up against the monarchy and those in power, all the aristocracy and the, the oligarchs and whatnot. And uh, they decided to do what we all know as the French Revolution of 1789. I love the um, French. It was about a, a lot of people. things. Tax structure, war debts with the Americans, politics, the assassins versus Templars. Yeah, I mean, yeah, well, obviously, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Like the hierarchical Eden. troubles yeah. and whatnot. Yeah, it was it was a crazy time, and the people rose up, and this was kind of like a big power to the people moment in history. But things kind of got a bit wild, right? Like there is a, a, a great moment where the National Assembly of the new French government was trying to be like, okay. What if we get together with the king and kind of create something where like we have our thing, but we keep the king and everything's good. And then the king's family was like, hell no. And so they, it was rumored we're going to lock up and dis dismantle the entire government. And uh, that's when people stormed the Bastille, which is a, if you're playing Assassin's Creed, I think is the start of that one. That is the, yeah, that's the beginning of the game. And people. It's a good game. It's worth playing. Don't worry about the people with no face. Go play that one. It's a good game. <laughs> yeah, no, they're, they have a face now. They, they found fixed it. that. I'm like, they found, they found their don't faces. worry about it. And, you know, that's kind of what was going on. It was chaotic. And in the early 1790s, we're basically in the middle of a French Civil War. One of the groups in this French Civil War was the Jacobins, which are basically like radical Republicans, not. And I need to say, not in the American way, but they're radicalized people who want a republic, basically, right? They're gotcha. willing to do anything they can to get a republic, and they do some truly heinous shit. When you're thinking guillotines, think of these people. Like, they killed a lot of people. I think of a couple things now when guillotines get mentioned. I, oof, I don't know what that means. I'm worried. <laughs> I'm worried. <laughs> Have I'm you seen the picture there. of you as a 14-year-old? Much it's all <laughs> worrying. <laughs> Dude, I had I was I was I was like Mega Mind's nephew, dude. I had a huge noggin. Well, Napoleon kind of dug all that. And so he returns from Corsica and throws in his lot with them. He's a pro-Jacobian. And uh as a history being an artillery commander, they were like, okay, we need this dude. He's got some skills. We don't really have one of those. So he is brought on as an artillery commander, and he is put in charge of the siege of the city of Toulon, which is a major port city into the Mediterranean. It's the biggest one in France still to this very day. It is a massive strategic objective. So whoever's going to lead this fight is going to end up being like very important on the historical stage. And they needed someone who could, you know, understand how to defeat city defenses or more importantly, like take over a nearby fort and then use that fort to launch an attack on the city. Well, that person probably would be the star of the Jacobian forces. And so at 24, taking the city, Napoleon is made brigadier general. That is so That's crazy. Great. That's like Bob Dylan writing a song, except Napoleon fucking sacked an entire city. <laughs> yeah. Close. yeah and Same thing. It, but, but it's, it, it doesn't end there. Because once again, things would change. And there was another resistance and a rising up against the Jacobians because the royalists still on the side of the monarchy were like, I, I, you know what? I'm starting to think these Jacobians are trying to kill off the monarchy and become the new monarchy. So they rise up against them. And Napoleon, who is known to have thrown his lot in with the Jacobians, right? He's like, okay, um, maybe, maybe this is, all right, maybe I need to think about this and change some things up. And so as this new regime, you know, takes control, he kind of like fades into the distance. He doesn't really get involved. He doesn't, you know, you think a military commander of this force. So he's like, nah, I'm, I'm going to stay out of this. But when that government changed, and not like, even there's so many government changes happening and Napoleon's kind of just like this constancy in it, right? He's always just kind of around and 
Again, another revolution rises up, and Napoleon is ordered to put down that that rising up. Because of his great victory at Toulon, he is sent to put down the insurrection, and, well, there you go. Once again, the government, the new government of France, owes Napoleon a favor. And so now... So he, he just goes and the, does it low-key. Yeah. Now he is one of the most famous people in France at 26. Jesus. Do you think do you think they invented board games so that we couldn't have another Napoleon? So like, <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. Would I be but a Napoleon it, if I hadn't played chess as a child? <laughs> actually, you'd probably be more Napoleon if you only played chess. I'll be honest. Thank you to HelloFresh for sponsoring this episode. And, uh, you know, I've talked about HelloFresh a bunch already. In fact, right now I can smell my brown sugar pork meatloaf in the oven. It's I've never had this one. I'm really excited, mostly because of the brown sugar. It's like, I don't know. I don't know. It's like the best of the sugars. Anyway, I, I just want to thank them for sponsoring the episode. If you don't know what HelloFresh is, it's simple. It's your farm fresh pre-portioned ingredients in seasonal recipes that are delivered directly to your doorstep. You skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and honestly, the best part, affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. Quality is HelloFresh's priority. Ingredients travel directly from the farm to your home in less than seven days, so you know that they're fresh. Whether you're hosting a party or just stocking up on snacks, you'll find everything you need at HelloFresh Market. From quick breakfast to charcuterie boards and desserts, it's never been easier to prep for a party or just fill up your pantry. And charcuterie? I had to practice that one to make sure that I pronounced that right. And if you're traveling, HelloFresh has plans that will work with your schedule. You can change your preferences, change the delivery day, or just change your address in a few clicks. HelloFresh, as I said, has gone on to replace three meals a week for almost two straight years now, and it's not going to change anytime soon. Saves me money, makes me not have to think, and the cooking is fun and easy with easy step-by-step -step directions for people like me who cannot cook. If you've been wondering if HelloFresh is going to work for you, honestly, this is the best time to do it. You go to HelloFresh.com slash Chill18, use our code Chill18, and you're going to get 18 free meals and free shipping. That's as straightforward as I could possibly be. That's HelloFresh.com slash Chill18, and use code Chill18 for 18 free meals and free shipping. Thanks again to HelloFresh for sponsoring the episode, America's number one meal kit. And so a lot of revolutionary uprisings are happening, and like I said, Napoleon is this constant. And once he reaches this sort of status of celebrity hero and a new government takes over. They see him as being one of their great commanders, but not like that great. Cause again, even with all these revolutions, even with all this BS, he is still from like not an important French household. He's from Corsica. So the French dudes don't really give a damn truly about him. And so while there are great uh, armies led in the north against Germany and their great armies like we have to fight the sea battles against the British. Napoleon is given command of the army of Italy and the army of Italy. Basically, their whole thing is in northern Italy. We're going to fight the Austrians. That's kind of the vibe of what's going on right now. The Austrian Empire was huge and they're like, we got to take these guys out. And so that's where they sent him. And for years and years and years and years, the conflict there was kind of at a stalemate. The Austrians were dug in. And the French, really, their troops there had nothing. They were ill-supplied. They, they truly were just, it was unfair. Well, Napoleon shows up and he starts giving crazy speeches. One of the, I don't know the exact quote here, but one of the speeches he gave was literally just like, I know you don't have anything. I know we don't have anything. France sent us here with nothing, but you know who has stuff? Italy. It's right over there. We just take it. And it's ours. Plus, we get the glory back in France. Not a he's like not a bad deal. And the French troops are like this guy's on to something. They got all the we stuff. Just go God over damn. there. I wish that I lived in this simple ass time. Right. He's right. Let's just fucking go over there and take shit. Oh fuck yeah. yeah. They were like, and and so he starts making unexpected, crazy moves, picking targets with haste. If you look up Napoleonic tactics online, it's all about speedy movement. Combined assaults with infantry and cavalry and artillery. He is going hard on northern Italy. And so in the late 19, uh, excuse me, in the late 1790s, Napoleon with less men, less supplies, manages to outmaneuver all of the Austrian forces in Italy. And when the Austrians surrender, 
He's like, you know what? We don't need all this. You guys can have Venice. And they like <laughs> thank him for it. He's like, you can have it. Like, don't even stress. You can have Venice. <laughs> it's one of those fake choice. They're like fake gifts, though. It's like instead of murdering you, you still get some some land. What is the vibe with these people? Like what? How do they make decisions? That's so crazy. <laughs> I mean, this is the same time where when soldiers would go into combat in order to not run away, they'd be forced to stand side by side, fire, reload, fire again. And they were like, you got to give me at least two shots, bro, before you run. Like, that yeah. was like, like, no wonder they cut everybody's heads off. Like, what yeah. the fuck? So isn't it? Correct me if I'm wrong, Jesse, but don't we not know how they actually fought in the medieval times? We just take kind of best guesses. Well, this isn't medieval. This is, I know, this I know, is but like, yeah, we have more now, but I'm just because you're bringing up old tactics and stuff. Is that true? Am I misremembering? Do you know? Maybe I mean, we have. Know. So the things we definitely know throughout history is we understand why the Romans were so successful in their military conquest, because the way their units formed up and the way they mm -hmm. had shield walls and stuff. We get that. We understand why. You know, for example, um, in the Middle Ages, why war changed because of the longbow, right? The longbow fundamentally changed the way warfare was. And the same thing goes with like guns and, you know, that kind of thing. Do yeah. we know like what the fights were like in the Middle Ages? There's barely any records of any of that. Yeah. That's why it's called the Dark Ages. We don't know yeah. much about it except for like, like the guests religion. just ran at each other. <laughs> yeah, we don't know much about the Dark Ages. Uh, and then the Renaissance from then on, people kept like way better records. And yeah. a lot of the Renaissance stuff that we know about ancient Greece and Rome is because they were infatuated with ancient Greece and Rome in the Renaissance. So we have all this factual information. But again, you know, things like the uh, Library of Alexandria, countless generations of stuff burnt down. Gone. You know, you know, there's at least three or four secrets in there. Oh, yeah, there has to <laughs> be. You know, there's like three or four like bangers. There's in there. some alien ass fucking encounters. In well, it's, there. it's you know how in the last 20 years we rediscovered Greek fire, right? Yeah. Like that's a thing that no one knew existed and they were on boats blasting dudes. Remember when they saw the uh, remember when they put the Black Hawk helicopter in the fucking uh, Egypt ruins on the wall? They found like a Black Hawk helicopter. That's right. That I, want, is, I want to find out that about that. That's not real. Yeah. You think that's in the, yeah. that's you think in, that's in the library of Alexandria? Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe some of those batteries found that in there. the Egyptian colony. Yeah. That, there's that a hieroglyph of it. They, they, it's inexplicable. It's like Stargate. It's awesome. There's also the the astronaut, right? The astronaut that's in there in the hieroglyphs. Yeah, or the light bulb that's not a light bulb. Yeah, 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 yeah all that. The battery. Yeah, yeah. it's you all think there. They got a little chapter book about that. It, <laughs> so, Napoleon is making perfect plays. He's doing not only great tactical and command decisions, but also. Some like pretty next level political stuff, right? He ensures this guy would slaughter at Civ Six. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no he shit. ensures that the Austrians aren't going to come back around at him, right? Because he is like, "Hey, I gave you Venice. Like we're chill." Obviously, that's not going to stop anyone long term, but it certainly is a okay. I can relax for a minute. Well, at twenty eight, Napoleon returns to Paris as a hero. This dude's making me feel like shit. I'm six years older than that right now. What the hell? <laughs> what the fuck have I done? And as the hero of France, he is tasked with something that, you know, might if I if I was a French commander, I'd be like, oh boy, here we go. He is tasked with taking on France's longtime foe, the British. Oh yeah. But unlike any previous attempts at war, Napoleon doesn't look at like crossing the channel or fighting you know some great sea battle he looks to the middle east the opposite direction of great britain mm. why you might ask he said europe is but a molehill everything wears out this tiny europe does not offer enough glory we must go to the east all great glory has always been gained there the poor middle east man <laughs> they've always just been the scapegoat of everything and to be and honest so, for such a smart guy that's a fucking that's a wild take well the reason why is he sees it as being where all of great britain's valuable holdings are things like all their wealth that they have is coming from that part of the world and he's also kind of full of himself at this point and he like his idols before him julius caesar and alexander the great must go and walk through egypt he must go to Egypt and conquer it like his two greats before him. And so in 1798, 
while his men, poorly equipped for the summer weather of the desert, they land and uh, they actually, I think they landed in Alexandria and they marched to Cairo and they're just like, dudes are dying of dehydration. It's a mess. But even though the elements are throwing everything they have at him, he's still marching his troops. And in what is known as the Battle of the Pyramids, he Sick. fights the forces of Cairo. And Napoleon gets off a banger here where he says, soldiers from the height of these pyramids, 40 centuries look down upon you, which is a pretty baller thing to say. Do you think he was standing right on top of the Great Pyramid? I don't think that, <laughs> I don't think that happened, but megaphone? it would have been just as cool. <laughs> And in the battle that followed, anywhere between 2,000 to 20,000 Egyptian soldiers were killed and only 29 French were killed. Jesus Crazy. Christ. Yeah, it was a pretty sound defeat for the forces of Cairo. God, it must have been so dope like to be a smart person like back when they just didn't know anything. You could just be like, what about this? And people would be like, oh, my God. <laughs> Every what? idea was a new idea back yeah. then, man. It's a, you know, what a fascinating time. That is wild. And this, my friends, is where perhaps an apophical tale was told about Napoleon. Once he had taken Egypt, he ventured into the Great Pyramid alone by himself into the king's chamber. And there, directly at the center of the pyramid, he would stay the night alone. Black Adam, dude? With <gasps> nothing but a single candle. What the hell? When he emerged the next day, he was ghostly white, completely shaken. And when his officers were like, dude, what happened? He refused to answer their questions. By the end of 1799, he was the first consul of France. And by 1804, he was emperor. <laughs> <laughs> and man took some of that uh, Egyptian kush, maybe. I don't this know. Is like, what, like, this is uh, like the crossroads. <laughs> His rise to power is one of great skill and foresight, but also incredible fortune and luck. He was a man who knew how to manipulate turbulent times to just like play others against each other. And he was this like great figure for the people of France that was always present. Even when other political figures get knocked out and like killed and beheaded, it's crazy. He's always there. And when asked about all this on his deathbed, and this is a quote from the Smithsonian, hauling himself painfully upright, he began to speak only to halt immediately and say, oh, what's the use? He murmured, sinking back. You'll never believe me. Get the fuck out of here. God damn you. <laughs> damn you, Napoleon. Now, like I said, it's an apophical tale. Uh, his private secretary is like, that never, that never happened, that never happened. But according to legend and a lot of other people, Something definitely happened or was happening to Napoleon. And what I'm about to tell you is one of the creepiest, best things in all of history. It may be total propaganda because a lot of this came out after his death, but it's certainly worth thinking about and certainly interesting because today's episode is not about Napoleon. Okay. Today's episode is about his very close friend. Okay. Now, throughout history, Fate and destiny have often played a role in legends and stories of the past. Mythologies and great adventures often begin with a call to action by some oracle or harbinger. And it should come as no surprise then that the legend of Napoleon has one such harbinger. But it does not start with him. In the 16th century in Paris, Queen Catherine de' Medici, who was, you know, known to me frequently with a uh, suspicious character after her husband king henry ii died she helped build a castle uh, a castle tuileries which is this uh you know it was sort of a i want to get out of where we've been i want to live in a new place that kind of thing and it's absolutely a beautiful thing yeah you can kind of imagine the idea of I don't want to live in that other place. I'm going to live in a new place because my husband, the king, just like that kind of vibe, right? Like if something bad happens, you might want to move like that kind of thing. And so she goes and she moves into this place. However, she quickly leaves because she keeps encountering someone who supposedly already lives there. Le Homme Rouge, a little red man. 
who Get harassed the fuck out of here, who harassed her with threats that she would die in Saint Germain or Saint Germain. For Alex, this is for you. I'm gonna see if I can fit this in here. As the Tuileries were in the parish of Saint Germain l'Auxerrois, the queen forsook the palace in which she had been so greatly interested. She refused to visit again Saint Germain and Lay. And she even de declined to cross the bridges lest she should find herself in the vicinity of the Abbey of Saint Germain, then situated just outside the Port Bussy. It, ah, it is impossible to cheat destiny after having avoided for the rest of her life, with the greatest care, anything suggestive of this dreaded name. She fell dangerously ill in the Hotel de Soissons, which she had constructed near the parish Saint Eustache, feeling herself at the point of death. She asked the name of the Benedictine monk who was administering to her the last sacraments and <laughs> learned that it was Laurent de Saint-Germain. Well, this presence, whatever this little red man that appeared to her, Hellboy, whatever it was, <laughs> was felt throughout the 16 and 1700s. The red man would go on to become a prominent legend at the palace, said to always wear red head to toe, either a cape or a cloak, and he had sort of a hideous face, perhaps misshapen. Some even attribute devilish features. Always seen as a sinister presence. And always, it's said, he would appear when some great disaster or calamity was drawing near. A portent of death. Dude, it's like Mothman's like caretaker. A portent of death and destruction. It's like Vandal yes. Savage. It's literally like the ageless man who influences all of history. Exactly. He who remains? He earned the nickname the Little Red Man of Destiny during this time. Dude, where's this guy? Maybe he could have gotten me some sick powers. The right hand Maybe. of doom. He Over the centuries, pancakes. it is said that he appeared on the days leading up to so many great tragedies, like Henry IV and his aides seeing him right before his assassination, the maids seeing him by the bedside of Louis XVI in the days leading to his death. For Mathis, this one is for you. Marie Antoinette's women were sitting in the sa I'm gonna I'm not I don't got that French twang that Alex got, so bear with me. Sale de garde when they became suddenly aware of the presence of a small man clothed from crown to heel in scarlet, who looked at them with such unearthly eyes that they were frozen with terror. They rushed to the apartments of the Madame de la Dauphine and related their adventure. The red man is then seen again by the guards in her prison cell just before Marie Antoinette is famously killed. But the little red man wasn't just a creepy stalker who watched royalty get killed. No, no, because according to legend, after years of watching French leadership bumble around and make terrible mistakes, he decided to play a more active role. And he as became legend, a general. As legend has it, <laughs> the little red general. he was a big fan of a certain French artillery officer. <laughs> and this is where things, according to folktale and lore, mythology, this whatever you like, want to believe, this is where the course of history changes. Because it is said the little red man first appeared to Napoleon in the, in the, in the pyramids in, in 1798 on the Egyptian campaign after the Battle of the Pyramids, where it's said that that night where he was inside that tomb, he went time traveling, he came to him. He appeared oh. to him in the tomb. Okay, shit. And I like how you went to time travel. That's pretty fun. <laughs> I was excited. Maybe the, 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 that's where he learned he could time travel. I don't know where. No, I was no, no. That. In the darkness lit by only one candle, the red man appeared to Napoleon. And he told him not only would he help him foresee his future, but that he had been there watching him since he was a child and that he would go on to have 10 years of great victories in Europe. While in Egypt, he also warned Napoleon about his current campaign. He said to him, his soldiers, a lot of them, uh, they're restless, they're not obeying orders, and that your next campaign, your push to the West, is going to fail. And then, he peaced out. And the rest is kind of history there. What ended up happening is after they defeated the Egyptian army, they pushed to the West, and they got beaten badly. The British even came down and burnt his like boats oh, that were off the coast. Like they, He got wrecked at that point. Yet, just like the little red man had told him, listen, man, I can help you. There's going to be some setbacks. It's going to be fine. When Napoleon comes back to France, even after 
kind of ending his campaign on a defeat, which I did not mention in the original story, even after he kind of comes back, it doesn't really matter because the governments keep changing and people keep loving Napoleon and he's still around. and Everything is good for him. And very soon after, he becomes consul. So now things that we know about this little red man start to come at us from secondhand accounts of people who are hearing a thing or saw a thing and then told a person the story. But there are a lot of references to the little red man once Napoleon takes over as emperor. Oh, wow. And Where? the first Wait, one. What? Yeah. I'm just oh, yeah. I'm buckled up, my man. I'm not even going to question. I want to hear more of this. Oh, yeah. The first one is uh, potentially <laughs> written in. Again, a lot of this is like, like I said, it's after his death. And so we're getting uh, memoirs from his aides. Like in this case, the first one is from uh, Count General Rapp, who is the guy who's writing Napoleon's memoirs. And he tells a story about how one night Napoleon grabbed him. And uh, Mathis, this is for you. This is what he asked him. What the fuck? Do you see me up there? That is my star. There it is shining before you. It has never left me. I see it in all great moments. It commands me to go forward. That is always a sign of good luck for me. And in the memoirs of Marshal Auguste de Maumont, uh, or Marmont, we'll see, whatever, uh, he writes of another moment where Napoleon is arguing with Cardinal Joseph Fesch. And this is also for you, Mathis. At the end, the emperor took Fesch by the hand, opened the window, and led him onto the balcony. Look up there, he said. Do you see anything? No, replied Fesch. I see nothing. Well, then learn to hold your tongue, the emperor went on. I see my star. It is that which guides me. Do not compare your weak and imperfect faculties to my superior organization. Woo! I'd be so out of there. Is, yeah, so he's, it's only him. He can, he's the only one that sees it. Apparently, he's the only one who sees this star guiding him. Now, a lot of people assume maybe this star was the red man, that it is this figure that is guiding him throughout his entire life, has always been there, perhaps, is the I've been watching you since you were a kid kind of vibe, which is how Napoleon is consistently in the right place at the right time. Maybe, as legend says, he continued to be with him through his decisive defeat of the British and the Austrians at Wagram, Wagram, boy, I know I'm saying that wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Wagram. 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 And he was supposedly seen throughout several battles that took place in Europe, always dispensing advice, always offering suggestions, but never actually like seeing the two of them. You know, like they're not like chatting it up, right? He's just like, there's this guy around. And he's like, maybe you should shoot that thing. Maybe you should do this thing. To what end? Well, here's the thing he had all this advice and one very specific instruction. Don't wage war on Russia. But Napoleon, by this point, was filled up with power and ego, and he was listening less and less to the advice of this guy. And eventually, he would launch a campaign against Russia. And the little man rushed to Napoleon, and according to one of his counselors, this is what transpired. Alex, this is for you. In the month of January 1812, the winter preceding the Russian campaign, the red man asked the sentinel if he might speak to the emperor. The soldier replying in the negative, the demon brushed him aside and ran quickly up the steps. He said to a chamberlain, Tell the emperor that a little red man whom he saw in Egypt wishes to see him again. Napoleon admitted the petit don. A long conversation followed in the private cabinet. From a few words that were overheard, Napoleon seemed to be pleading for something which was refused. Finally, the door was opened. The red man came out, passed quickly through the corridors, and disappeared on the grand staircase, which nobody saw him descend. Hmm. Like, and, he uh, just fucking walked out and then just, boop. Yeah. That's, what you're, that's what that means? Fascinating. That's what they're saying. They're saying they that he went down the stairs the and, then, like, and just vanished like a ghost. Like, he turned that corner and, like, I don't know, like a field of dreams faded into the corner. This, this is Assassin's Creed. <laughs> this is nonsense. This is crazy. Well, as all historians will tell you, Napoleon went ahead with his invasion of Russia. And in like, it's hard to describe how insane this is. He takes half a million men, which at the time is like even now, half a million men in one like push in an army 
half a mi- 500,000 dudes, right? Yeah, that's that's yeah. an insane number. Like, if it, you think about Dodger Stadium, Dodger Stadium's like, what, 25,000 men? That's like, no, no, 60,000 is the most that's ever been in there. That times six, seven, <laughs> eight. It's 500,000. The largest army seen at the time. Maybe I'm sure you could go back to like a crusade thing and they probably have something wacky there. But again, the records are sparse. I, I do not know. But at the time, this was insanely big because it's almost as if he was warned against doing this. And he was like, no, nah, I'm taking no, no chances. Let's roll. And as history will say, and as it is known, they got thrashed, unprepared for ruthless Russian tactics and horrendous Russian winters. They were so That's always a big one with like in history when it comes to invading Russia, defending Russia's the winters. Yep. Are, I can't think of a like, worse the thing. campaign to be on than this one. I, I, I don't I don't that know if there was ever yeah, a worse God. campaign ever waged. Um, imagine imagine being a soldier st- under Napoleon's rule right now in a Russian fucking winter. There's some sick paintings of this, by the way. I will simply say that they were so brutally beaten that on the retreat home. Only 10,000 soldiers returned alive. Wow. That's 490,000 dead men. Is it unfathomable? It's unfathomable. And it's How like, many people were even in France is the question. You know what I mean? Like that's half a million people. This would be from his like pulled from the entire empire at the time, right? It's emperor here. So he has lots of kingdoms. He's pulling everyone and he has this audacity to roll up into a Russian it's poorly planned, which here's the thing. It's it, it, when you look at what the Germans did that you're like, OK, Hitler was like, I got to do this thing because my timetable, he like he had a weird timetable in his head and it totally screwed him. Napoleon, I don't think there was a timetable, but maybe there was right. Maybe he worked so fast because there was something in the background he's going. It's like the, he's got that Beatles uh, curse on him where it's just he's got 10 good years and then it's only other universes where he's still succeeding. <laughs> maybe. Yeah. <laughs> This is considered the turning point of, the, of, of his entire uh, leadership and, and empire. And just after that, he has losses at like Leipzig and uh, Fontainebleau and, of course, Waterloo, right? The Little Red Man, nowhere to be seen. But on New Year's Day, 1814, he returns to Napoleon. That's got to be is a, near the end of a Napoleon's... Absolutely. Absolutely. This is uh, an actual thing that is fascinating to me that I just, you know, I'm going to split it in two so you can get both in this one thing. But here you go. The first time we met was in Egypt at the Battle of the Pyramids. This is what he says to him, by the way. This is what the this is overheard a conversation overheard by like dudes around Napoleon. This is the conversation between the little red man and Napoleon. The first the first time we met was in Egypt at the Battle of the Pyramids. The second after the Battle of Wagram. I granted you four years more to terminate the conquest of Europe or to make a general peace, threatening you that if you did not perform one of these two things, I would withdraw my protection from you. Now I am come, for the third and last time, to warn you that you have now but three months to complete the execution of your designs or to comply with the proposals of peace offered you by the Allies. If you do not achieve the one or accede to the other, all will be over with you, so remember it well. Napoleon then expostulated with him to obtain more time on the plea that it was impossible in so short a space to reconquer what he had lost or to make peace on honorable terms. And here's the second part. Do as you please, said the red man, but my resolution is not to be shaken by entreaties nor otherwise, and I go. He opened the door. The emperor followed, entreating him, but to no purpose. The red man would not stop any longer. He went away casting on his imperial majesty a contemptuous look and repeating in a stern voice, three months, no longer. This is such a fairy tale style story. This is a Witcher side quest. This is what this is. It really feels like, yes, it feels like like it's something out of a Witcher tale or something. It's a very bizarre story. One that is like this character who, I guess, I don't know, do we have any French listeners? I guess this is like, The red man, the little red man is like a famous folk creature in 
uh, maybe all of France, but definitely Paris from what I've read online. It's, and what's even crazier is there is stories of him appearing in Detroit. That's hilarious. Like, you know, in France, Detroit? I, huh. Yes, 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 yes. It's not America, Detroit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a... Uh, <laughs> It's, yeah. it's interesting, like I, I said as a joke earlier, but now it's like a little bit more when it comes to like comparison to Jeff the Mongoose, if, especially if you look at Jeff the Mongoose in the in the lens that he comes as like a fairy or fae, he's a fae creature in some way, mm -hmm. who found an interest in a family, caught them rabbits, fed them information and just enjoyed their company until it was done. He was done with it. And this feels similar, like he found something that interested him. Comes into our little world, plays his games because human lives probably mean nothing. So and when he got sick of him or he realized that he was trying to like be rid of him, he was like, fine, no more. Like it has that same kind of vibe of otherworldly, fey like hilariousness. But unlike a devil creature, because I feel like it's nice that they call him the little red man. Because I'm like, yeah, a he doesn't devil seem like whatever, a devil. No, yeah. He's not like, yeah, he watched a bunch of royals die, but he's not trying to screw Napoleon over. He literally is like, I gave you a timetable. I told you what to do. You didn't listen to me. It's on you, bro. And now I'm saying you have three months to like wrap it up or you're done. And here's the crazy thing. That was January 1st, 1814. And on March 31st, the allies invaded Paris. Get the fuck out and of And on the 1st of April, Napoleon was forced to abdicate. Wild. <sighs> that is interesting, man. This I just like think like, why Russia? Why is like that the line for that guy? And well, I, I, I mean, it may not be like, it, you know, it may not be some weird mystical connection. It may just be like he knew yeah. that was going to end badly and tried to warn the guy. And he was like, yeah, I'll bring every soldier I have. Then we'll win. And he's like, bro, I tried to tell you. Yeah, I don't know. It, it, but, he, but he claimed to have, to have a protection over him. So he was granting him some sort 10 of 10 years. Quote. He said 10 years of victories. Yeah, it's not. Yes, yeah, so I'm saying it's nuts. Like, I wonder, you know, looking at it from like a mischievous entity perspective, if he was just leading him to bar battles, he knew where it would be hilarious to watch like him win things that just made him chuckle. And Russia was not on this list of things like he cared about. Maybe. And like, I, I just, mean, just throwing at it. It's just a fun, it's fun the way he, I'm trying to like look at the way he's acting sure. and just like trying to apply some sort of, of logic. It's just fa it's fascinating. It's a fascinating story. And what's even crazier is Napoleon was sent away to his famous remote island. Yep. And he stayed there until he died. I think <coughs> of stomach cancer, I think in 1821, but he never saw the red man again. He was Did just he put on his star, island though. No record of any of that. He, he, like, he said like, he saw it when his sick dying in his dying days, right? When he grabbed the no, guy. No, no, when he was dying, they they asked him like, yo. What the hell was that? Yeah. What happened? And he's like, I, if I told you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe, believe me. me. Okay, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we don't know. But we don't know to what end this entity has done this. No, the first time, the first recorded time of his existence is Catherine de' Medici building the castle. Uh, and then here's the best part. The red man. You think you'd be gone, he'd be gone forever, but that's not true. Mathis, this actual, this is from the London Daily News okay. in 1883. Love it. What a great time to be in England, by the way. This is another sighting of this guy. It's fascinating. The old watchman who had charge of the building was going his rounds one night. When this he is the castle. Yeah. When he became aware of a scarlet clad figure in the gloom, skulking behind one of the pillars. He made for it, but it seemed to pass around the pillar and disappear. He looked about everywhere, but there was nothing. The old man had his reasons for thinking that he might have been deceived on this occasion, so he took nothing but coffee after dinner next night before making his rounds. Yet there was the red man again. This time he was leaning meditatively on his arm and looking down on Paris. The watchman shouted at him. He turned round, faced him with the same look of icy woe, and disappeared. The old man ran for help, late as it was, and they made a thorough search of, uh, a thorough search of the place. They did find something red. Their search ended in a suave capu as they saw the first glare of the incendiary fire that was to reduce the palace Good of the Tuileries Lord. to a heap of ruins. And that's from the London Daily News, 1883. Yeah, he uh, the last time that he was seen at that palace was when he burned it down. Well, what ended up he happening took everything is everything from Napoleon, it sounds like like, like every last thing. Another revolution happened and the new government was super anti-monarchy and they burnt the place down. What? In and the so 
with it, he was like, I guess, looking at the end of his castle. And he was like, well, this is a shame. That's why he was like looking out the windows, just like really depressed. And then when they finally got back to him in the background of the window is the building on fire. <laughs> Literally Q. Literally. To it's totally Who's to bizarre. say that Q is not inspired by such stories? I just want to know why. I just want to know what to what end. He's just a like a like a Where's, god would do, figure that I can do whatever be a he really wants. fun pawn for this guy if he wants to show up. I will sign up to be emperor of the world and not invade anywhere you tell me not to invade, my guy. And that, it, what's fascinating about this is that that is a story told after Napoleon's death. Again, yeah, that could be just propaganda to be of like course. devil war. Should be on, could be like who yeah. knows. But what's interesting is after the the palace burnt down, which is convenient if you're like, where'd that guy go? <laughs> right? There were legends and myths that he did not die. He did not vanish forever. Some say he, he simply moved to another palace, uh, Elysee Palace. I Boy, I, I don't know if that's pronounced correctly, but I guess he's just been around. And people said they see him in times of turmoil or trouble in France, and he's been there for years and years. Throughout the 1800s, Only France, he was though, there. he's never been seen outside of France. Like I said, he so was he's in like the patron not, saint not of America, French Detroit, excellence. but like, yeah, I, I don't know. Like, I, I. He is just this weird, the same thing with the Mothman. The same thing. Yeah. It's just another creature, this weird thing that exists that is a connection to Napoleon, but also monarchs who came before him in the 1600s and 1700s. Like, just, it's a fascinating tale I of mean, this creature. Who's to say they're not all one of the same sort of phenomenon, you know, or a part or a different sliver of all the same UFOs, cryptids, little devil man, you know, uh, who knows? Yeah, it's, I, I, it's all that. But it's part of that. It's just part of that, like consciousness and like we're not seeing reality. We're seeing what our brain is telling us we're seeing is reality. We're are really looking at an interface of what our brain filters, and we we don't really know what to actually. Think. It's. Uh, I love that, and, and I hate that topic because we'll never. There's no end. There's no end to that conversation. But it all, like I said, it also could be just BS, right? Yeah, of course. Maybe Napoleon when you talk about a star. That's just his ego being he like, he's like, you don't see that Pope or like whatever Cardinal, you don't see that or him like talking out his ass to his commanders or, you know, like the stories of the little red man could all be propaganda by the, I mean, this is the British, right? I can so see him using that star story to the Cardinal or whatever as a way of just being like, you know, like him not being very religious. It's like, oh, I'm sorry. You know, I don't listen to your God's words. You, oh, you can't see my star. That's unfortunate. You just don't, you're just not special enough. But at the same time, Napoleon is a figure who had so many like crazy weird victories over a short period of time that it doesn't make a lot of sense considering what was going like if you can imagine if you were a military officer and you sided with one group in a revolution, the other revolution group would come and kill all of you. Right. Because you couldn't, Napoleon's cruising through all this because everyone's like, oh man, no, we need so a good tight. artillery he's tight, guy. He's tight, he's tight, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and he would just, and what's interesting is that his father, when, so his father in, in, in Corsica was like part of the Corsican free people's movement. And when the French were like, look, we really need some favors, he really quickly switched and joined the French and sent his son to go off and do stuff. So when there was trouble back in Corsica when Napoleon went back there as a kid. None of the people there wanted to mess with him. So the call back to France was easy for him. They're, like he want, he hated France. He didn't want to go back to France, mm. but he still did because everyone in his home was like, you traitor, get out of here. And so he went like, there's so many weird moments that line up perfectly to be like this dude who like no one liked artillery commanders and yet they all needed this one guy yeah. he didn't want to be in france yet had to be in france and every battle he fought was like skillful and like he created a whole new t set of tactics like he was using artillery cavalry and entry infantry at the exact same time which is not so people be like all right fire the cannons okay and now we're gonna send in <laughs> some troops and and it's, the it's, guy next to you's like Bleh, gone it's like a bullet yeah. hits something like reload your gun it's like the eternals it's like this dude is you know uh, what's the guy Barry Kogan the whoever, Mandela. that guy is the guy who plays the Joker in the Batman? Uh, yes, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. He plays uh, Druig, the the Eternal. Yep. And his deal is like he he they're supposed to like just watch over the humans, 
but he decides to like take an active approach and like manipulate the humans with his powers. <laughs> Make a cult or two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, That's know, this. Fun. That's this. <laughs> it's an alien. A mocky. I mean, the, the star in the sky thing is like my brain obviously went to. <laughs> that was good. That's right. a good that was, one. That's time to yeah, learn from really We got him. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. yeah, yeah. My, listen. My my ADHD brain needs a moment to absorb, process joke, recognize if it actually understands the reference, and then I can laugh. <laughs> you were like, "Is that a movie? Is that <laughs> uh, uh, no? I don't think so." Uh, no. Yeah. I thought for a minute you had like maybe UFOs or you, you can t- with the star in the sky thing, but not. Nah, it's way for me. It, falls way more in line with something like a weird fey creature that just kind of popped in to fuck around and left Puck. when he was bored. It's a Sandman issue. And let's not forget this all somehow also equates to him in one of the stories going to the Great Pyramid, going into the King's Chamber and staying there the night. That's wild. Like, just to do that is crazy. <laughs> like, you have to be an insane person to do that. And already there's all the mythological and crazy UFO things and stuff that happens from that. That, that you know, we talk oh, yeah. about that may or may not be real. And so you have this story, which may or may not be real, about a man who went in there and had a may or may not be real thing happen to him. And that already is crazy. Do we know if he actually did go into the uh, the the uh, pyramid at least or no? Do we not know? So, Are we so not sure of that? They 100%, he and his troops 100% like, climb the outside like scout mm-hmm. like they definitely were there they fought a battle right in yeah, front but of it. nobody knows if he's actually went in for a the night. story of him going into it is one where again mm-hmm. it's a story that is told but his personal aid was like that never happened but everyone like a bunch of other people were like dude that definitely happened and so it's one of those things where like do you believe the dude who's like um i might be covering for no like yeah know. yeah He's either 100% telling the truth and didn't happen because he's his closest friend or he's covering for him because he's his closest friend. And that like is one of those weird history things that I, I wonder because I don't know much about how Napoleon was as a person kind of all of his life. But I, I wonder if also like he did go into there and spent the night, but he like came out with a willingly like just to build his legend, to build more. Uh, just like, you know, fame in his corner, completely made up by him. If he did that often enough, there's a lot of people who like. That's enough to get them going. Like you, you like build yourself your own fake little story about how you came Dude, to power and people would fall right in line. It, you are so right on the money with this that Napoleon, he was very, very smart. But he was also a little bit full of himself. So in the mm. Italy campaign, when he was fighting in Italy, as they were like routing dudes and like kicking ass, he took over a town. And I don't remember the name of the town, but <clears throat> in the center of it was a castle and he made that castle his headquarters. And outside, he put up giant ass banners and he made it look like the most amazing, spectacular, insane Mm -hmm. thing ever. Mm -hmm. And anyone in the area who wanted shit done had to go and like see Napoleon on his throne. Right. But the brilliance of Napoleon was that when he returned to France after his campaign in Italy, he didn't adorn any of the like ceremonials. He like showed up just like a normal soldier. I'm here to do my job. But when he was out, in the field, it, he was the you know being an emperor unto himself, right? Yeah. His soldiers looked up to him; they loved him. The people he treated them like well, but also was like, "I got a firm fist." His enemies, he was like, "You can have Venice." Like he was playing the game of politics, and then yeah, when he yeah. went back, he was like, "I'm just a humble servant. It's yeah. no big deal." That is that. Made, that makes I don't know if that's weirder or better. Like I don't know if that makes me like Napoleon more or 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 less. It reminds me, like, even, so, you know, say the little red man is completely false. We'll just say he's not, he doesn't exist. I mean, there's another argument to build that he was, like, weirdly practicing without realizing it, like, chaos magic. The ability to, like, he just, like, he saw himself in such fantastic ways. His perception of reality ended up becoming his reality for quite a while. And, like, those fast movements and stuff, again, at a time where that wasn't really known anyway, going to catch people by surprise. It is going to surprise the shit out of him. And as he builds on his legend, and adds lies and adds stories about him maybe being mythical, it makes all the more sense of him becoming emperor so fast. And he just sets himself up to never be forgotten. And it does seem like that was a big goal. It, 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 and what's interesting is that perhaps that's because of his childhood of mm. mediocrity. Really? Yeah. Like oh, he was course. going to be nothing. And he was like, I saw what it's like to have power when I was in France. Mm-hmm. I want that so badly. But at one point he gave it up and he went home and his home rejected it. So... It's very, it's like, Maybe a they were like weird, finally happy to get rid of the annoying fucking egocentric narcissistic Napoleon. We're like, nah, man, maybe get out. 
His his parents were kind of big shots on the island, right? Mm. But being a big shot on the island means nothing in France. Yeah. And so who but again, this also when you talk about like maybe there was no red man, whatever, this also kind of goes to the idea of just ego in general. Yeah. And how far I know we talked about it you. earlier. I know we talked about quitter earlier, but if you just think about the idea of someone like an Elon Musk who has had countless wins. He must be, like he must be just, a genius. Yeah, he must be. Yeah, and everyone's like, oh, he's so, he must be. And he's like talking all this crazy stuff and everyone's like, yeah, hell yeah. And then much like Napoleon and much but like. Nobody, yeah, nobody digs a level deeper about where he came from, though, and how he got CEO. They did this but thing, Napoleon like, was the same like Napoleon came from stuff. He just wasn't the right stuff. You know what I mean? Right. Yep. So he worked his ass off to become the right stuff. And then he just kind of like, you know, like, like, uh, you know, Elon buying the right companies. Like Elon right, didn't exactly. make Tesla. Right. He didn't like, he bought the right companies. He bought SpaceX. He bought, right. and he just like was in the right place, at the right time to get the right things. And people were like, this guy's a genius. He's the smartest person in the world. And very clearly lately, it's very obvious that that was just legend and not real. And much like Napoleon, I think he got hype on his own legend and he was like, I can handle Russia. And then after that, it was defeat after defeat after defeat. It's like a lesson. It's like a fucking fable. That's why it's so funny mm -hmm. to me. Like, yeah, it, I don't know how can like in, in the actual historical context, if we're talking to like some sort of Napoleon uh, specialist expert, I don't know how much it has this like perfect mythological structure of Napoleon getting too big for his little short man britches and then <laughs> going for Russia and then getting totally just like bodied by the, the same and at ghost. one point he actually get thrown out and he came back and convinced the armies that were supposed yeah. to stop him to join oh, him. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yes. yeah. Yeah. I mean, he, yeah. like I said, after Russia, like they were, no one liked him and he still was like, come on guys. And they still had that kind of vibe <laughs> yeah, that, that cult of leader okay. charisma, that cult mm -hmm. leader charisma of a plot. Like it's uh, appealing to the, probably the most vulnerable and most egocentric pieces of, of the people he was it's trying to awfully hard to admit you're wrong it's just a known fact and so yeah. this dude who you followed your entire life and you were like for the briefest moment you're like that guy sucks when he comes back and is like baby i've changed you're like oh, so yeah, 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 all right man, okay bad. the the the, the closest the thing that makes you become a, an extremist is when you realize that the thing that you believed was not true like that you your entire life is about to shift that's when you don't want to let go. So you double down even in the that's face of correct. Yeah. That's what so many people do. I mean, hell, like I'm guilty of doing it, you know, but that's part well, of nobody in America does it, but everybody else does. it. <laughs> <laughs> what's what's fascinating, though, is going back to something you said, Alex, and it kind of relates to Little Red Man, the whole like Napoleon being a short guy. That's just British propaganda, really. Yeah, of course. Like, yeah, I'm sure he was average height. <laughs> yeah. And, and again, that's kind of like is the Red Man British propaganda, but it's a legend in France, so I'll tell you what, man. Uh, Little red knows, man shows man. up. I'm game. I don't give a damn. He's just praying for a like red man to years, come give him stuff emperor, all the time. If I'm an emperor of it's America a, in like five years, <laughs> emperor of America, I'll make you guys what do you think's gonna happen? If the I red man know, shows up, that. anything, anything could happen. I saw the 14 year old you. I don't want you as emperor. <laughs> no, that what, kid had had look in his eyes, and I was not gonna be like Joffrey. He had gone through a lot at that point, and he was only four foot. 10 and 86 pounds. <laughs> he was not having a great time in high school. I had to have my locker changed because the top one was too high and I couldn't see the combo. Oh, no. oh man, this, my heart. Oh, my little Napoleon. Oh, oh no. This really is your origin story. Yeah, this man, is it, is, it is. It's all there. I was the actual Napoleon. Wait till, I, oh, wait till you find God. out that he's the one who grabbed the green stone finally. Mathis did. That's it. It was me. That's how I, the podcast came into power. Yeah. All those diamond emojis you sent me when you were agreeing were just uh, green stone references yeah. and we weren't aware. Uh, well, Jesse, that was fucking amazing. That was a great story. I'm gonna I read no, I've never heard this. of the Little Red Absolutely Man and insane. Napoleon. Like, There is a lot of various texts and things on this. A lot of it's old, too. Mm. A lot of it is from the 1800s. And it again, like it has that vibe. It has that antiquity vibe to it. The stuff that I sent you is a lot of it's just from straight up books about it. And it is, you know, it's written kind of like a story and it feels like a story. It definitely it does. doesn't feel real. But at the same time, it's kind of like, huh, that's fun. Who knows, man? Yep. Because you pair it with a man who was so impulsive and did things so differently that the world didn't really know it's how to handle the him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so like, 
assigning fantasy and myth to that is a, just again a way for humans to rationalize how this guy probably like steamrolled everybody for like 10 years but he also tried to build his myth it's almost mm -hmm. oh yeah andrew wks yeah. where it's like he creates so Kinda many myths it. about himself yeah and he loves he clearly yeah. loved it that's why oh. he has all these paintings of him looking like a badass because yeah. he like i don't know how much of a badass he was but every bit of art that exists of him he looks like he's a stone cold killer riding horses <laughs> like an awesome dude it doesn't like, matter how badass he was because it, now that's all people believe that it, he had, she, he could be have been the most mediocre guy in the world, but the world remembers him as yeah. a great general. And what is reality if not what people perceive it to be? Right. And so, if people say he's a great general, then he must have been a fucking great general. Like it's not, and it's crazy that he achieved that. But again, we do have historical record that he just did some. He won a lot of like, wild fucking fights. Yeah, he also, the, the funny thing is, he also lost a bunch, too. Oh, yeah, But no one talks about that stuff because the victories were so, like, wild and over the top and crazy and well-planned that any losses were like, well, you know what? Losses happen, dude. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, you, you brush that aside. It doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> Those don't count. It's all part of the legend. It's yeah. awesome. I love, that's actually, that was a fascinating story, Jesse. Thank you. That He's was, a pretty important guy, either way. There's no way around it. <laughs> no, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He yeah. was the emperor. I was just saying, you know. And I'm saying that he was a mediocre guy. I'm saying like with the legend now, like, re, you know, people perceive him the way he I think he would be very happy with the way people perceived him nowadays. If he hadn't found the green stone. He would never have been the hero. That that's he was. true. Maybe that's what it, like. Yeah, that's what it was. Also, just like look at the timetable. It like again, as a historian, this stuff fascinates me. This is post American revolution where the French helped us out yep and then they had their own revolution and rather than end up with some like republic or democracy or whatever they went full emperor yeah. like they that just shows the you the fragility much. of america we were like thanks france yeah. good yeah. luck in your own revolution and they were like the emperor of europe <laughs> oh, 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 we changed the time way. itself <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy it's awesome well, thank you, Jesse, for that story. Speaking of uh, green and stoned, I'm for the mini soak oh, no. this time. I'm doing the wildest weed stories of 2022. So go check that out. <laughs> Patreon.com. Yes. Uh, yes. Let's go. I'm so excited now. <laughs> oh, hell yes. All right. We're going to be going to Patreon.com slash Illuminati pod at the $15 tier for that mini sode. We're off. Bean boy lives. <laughs> we'll be back. Uh, we'll be back next week with another episode. Thank you guys so much. Goodbye. Bye. Anyway. Me and my wife were sitting outside indulging on our porch one night, enjoying ourselves. I needed to go to the bathroom, so I stepped back inside, and after a few moments, I hear my wife go, Holy shit, get out here! So I quickly dash back outside, and she's looking up at the sky in awe. I look up too, and there's a perfect line of dozen lights traveling across the sky.